Let's continue looking at firewalls and um, their relationship to our perimeter defense. A few definitions. What is a firewall? And uh, as I was writing this, I became uh, aware that in recent years we've uh, um, we have more and more uh, firewalls that are that run on individual computers just to protect that one particular computer. I think it was Service Pack 2 with uh, XP that introduced a, uh, the firewall to the XP operating system. Um, Microsoft servers uh, operating systems have uh, uh, built-in firewalls um, now. Uh, Linux and Unix have always, uh, or at least for many, many years, have had the ability to uh, to run a firewall uh, on, on a box just for the express purpose of protecting that box. So um, I was reminded that uh, there's more to uh, this whole concept of a, of a firewall than what I was thinking at the time. So I'm going to qualify my definitions here with the word traditionally. So a firewall is traditionally software running on dedicated hardware. And if you have this situation, this is often called an appliance. Now this is a fairly new word, um, but it is used extensively. Or uh, it's a software running on a regular computer that's dedicated just to running the firewall. That's what its job is, or maybe one of its main jobs. So, moving on, a firewall traditionally, again, we're talking about, uh, we're not talking about the, I hesitate to use the word personal firewall, although that's what some products call the, um, the type of firewall that protects just a single machine. I um, guess we do need a better term there. But anyway, a uh, traditional firewall typically has two or more network interfaces. And my third bullet here was uh, what I've already explained. Um, that Recently firewalls have been added to servers and workstations. And again the point here is uh, these firewalls are, are to protect that particular computer. Um, and they're good things. We're, uh, we might get around to talking those, about those specifically. So, no matter what, what type of firewall you're talking about, um, what does the firewall do? Well, the firewall looks at every packet and evaluates it against a list of rules called a rule base. This is where the configuration comes in. Someone has to develop the list of rules and enter them into the firewall. And typically what happens here is the first rule that matches a particular packet is applied and typically the rules are um, you've evaluated from top from the top down so this has implications in um, um, the ordering of your your uh, firewall rules and uh, we're gonna we're gonna do some uh, experimentation with this and some uh, they're probably an assignment on this the actions that can be applied to a packet are to forward it to another interface. And sometimes it's really referred to as forward. Uh, other manufacturers uh, refer to it as accepting the packet. Um, so you run across different terminology. It's usually obvious what the uh, developer of the firewall meant, uh, meant um, for a particular word that they're using. 
and uh, the alternative is to not forward it. Uh, and again, we often refer to this as dropping the packet. And a rule that allows a packet to pass through is said to open a hole in the firewall. Uh, you want to minimize the holes in your firewall. The more holes, the less protection you have. Now, what can you write rules on? What, uh, what situations? Um, and this may not be a, uh, a complete list. That's the reason I put etc. down here. Um, and the reason I say this is we're adding more and more functionality to uh, firewall uh, applications. Um, so it's uh, there's probably things out there that I haven't seen yet. Anyway, you can write rules on source and or destination IP numbers in either a single IP number or you can do a whole whole range a, uh, a whole network and there's reasons why you should and we'll get into this later um, there are whole blocks uh, of addresses whole networks that you should block uh, both going and coming actually and I'll talk to you about those. You can also <clears throat> write your rules on source or destination TCP or UDP ports, um, protocols. You can um, block or allow by ICMP code. And type, etc. So, there's a number of things that you can. Uh, uh, I would refer to these all of these as qualifiers that you can use to write your rules on or about, if you prefer this. Here's a um, firewall functional diagram, and for some reason we have a little artifact here. This little little part right there doesn't really belong. So we have a network interface. We have two network interfaces here. Um, if we simply assume this is the the public side and I don't know why I drew a, um, a B. I'm uh, evaluating a new tablet here so Sometimes it does things I'm not really expecting. Anyway, I drew this diagram in Visio, so I guess I have an artifact here. That little uh, um, little ver uh, vertical line there doesn't belong. So if this is the public side, we can have packets going in. We have packets coming back out. You can draw that any way you want to. We'll assume this is the private side. Again, we can have packets going each way. Um, if our interf if our firewall had more than one interface, it would be over here somewhere, and we could um, there are obviously limits to how many interfaces you can have, but uh, I've seen. Um, advertisements for you know, five or six different interfaces if you have a complicated network. So let's look at uh, basically how this uh, would work. If you have a packet coming in from the public um, interface it's going to be passed into the engine then every rule in order in the rule base is going to be um, used to evaluate the packet and if it matches one of the rules it's going to be sent on through to a private one of these private interfaces um, well 
let's assume here that it matches and accept because we could have a rule that says deny. Um, so we'll put deny here. And um, the package just dropped. It's it simply uh, goes the way of all uh, ones and zeros that are no longer one go no longer needed. I'll just draw that on there to kind of give you some indication of you know what happens to it. And I'm showing a packet coming in from the outside. You can and actually should filter a certain amount of things going out of your network. Um, although we're typically much more liberal um, as to what we allow going out from the uh, from our network to the internet, there are still some things that it it's a good idea to uh, to filter. And again, we'll talk about those uh, later. So, where are you going to put your firewall? Now, remember, this is your traditional firewall. Um, there's several places uh, between your network. And any connection to the internet is uh, uh, certainly where you'd want to put one. Um, you could have uh, a firewall between the internet and your public web servers, FTP servers, email servers, and DNS servers. Um, probably. And if necessary, if it suits, suits the, um, uh, your own purposes or your internal security policies, uh, you could put firewalls between segments of your own network um, to control the flow of packets into and out of sensitive parts of your network. Um, for example, maybe your company does a lot of uh, research and development on new um, new products you might want to put uh, your um, you know the file servers that have uh, the new newly um, or the products under development you might want to put a firewall between that and uh, the rest of the um, people in your company that don't necessarily work with the new products um, to cut down on, on instances of uh, Industrial espionage and you know, your own workers stealing your secrets, and uh, we haven't really talked about that, but it is a big deal. Here we have a um, a drawing. This is a fairly uh, um, fairly typical arrangement, both from a company standpoint and uh, placement of your firewall. Um, and here is our firewall. It has uh, three interfaces. So we have one uh, for the um, what we often refer to as the public interface, and this is your private network. And then often we refer to this as the demilitarized zone. I really don't like that word or term. I prefer to call it the service network. Other things we have on here is this is a, a router. And not only are we going to use it as a router, uh, we're uh, also using it to do some uh, basic packet filtering. Now, if you're thinking that that's what the firewall does, you're correct. Um, 
there are some things that you can uh, let your router do that will take some of the load off of your firewall. Um, for example, I mentioned earlier that there are entire networks that you want to block. This is something that routers are really good at, blocking entire networks. So we're going to let our router do that, and then our firewall uh, won't have to worry about um, blocking those. And uh, this will improve the performance uh, of your firewall. It'll uh, hopefully keep it from being overwhelmed by the number of packets, um, among other things. So here's the internet, of course, to give you some idea where we're going to put our, uh, our router and our firewall. This, the lightning bolt here, is your uh, connection. to your internet service provider. We also refer to these as WAN links. Wide area network links. Now let's go out here and look in the service network and see what we have here. Um, and uh, you need to add S here. There are there needs to be two DNS servers here that are um, authoritative for your um, the fully qualified domain name of your um, of your web server. Now, um, depending on the size of your company, you might want to consider just farming this out. Um, for example, um, there are many. Um, companies that will do web hosting for you. Now, here's my uh, here's the things I think you need to think about it, uh, for your web server or your web hosting. Number one is how big is your company. Um, and number two, uh, well, number one, let me elaborate on number one. Um, the smaller the company, the more probably the more sense it makes to um, outsource the hosting. Um, but this leads us into number two. You have to consider what you're going to use your web server for. If it's information only, um, certainly it's not a big deal to have uh, another uh, a web hosting company um, host your web server. And also the DNS, the two DNS servers that's required when you register your your uh, internet domain name. Um, and if you're thinking this has nothing to do with firewalls, yeah, probably. But I'm going to talk about this while I'm thinking about it. Um, now, if you're going to use a web server to do electronic commerce, again, there are ways you can, uh, or companies that provide this particular type of service, uh, shopping carts, etc. So, even if you're a small company, you can probably, you know, uh, successfully farm all this out um, and then you won't have to worry about um, maintaining and securing the servers uh, etc at your site so there's some advantages to this um, if you're going to use your web server to extensively access uh, a database uh, it's probably well, it doesn't have to be, but often is running on a, a separate uh, um, database server. It gets more problematic to do that at somebody else's site. So that may be some reason you want to do it, uh, you know, host your own web server. And then internally you can, well, you can have it connect to an internal database server. So. We'll we'll look at that situation here uh, another slide or two. Um, anyway, the same thing actually goes for your email. You can either do it yourself or you can uh, you can farm it out. You can write a check every quarter, and uh, um, you often give up some functionality, but you don't have to worry about certain things that you would if you were. Um, maintaining it yourself. Anyway, 
if you decide to host all these yourself um, a really good option is to put these on a separate interface off of your firewall and uh, by putting it on by putting these machines on a separate interface you can write different rules to control traffic uh, into and out of that particular um, network the demilitarized zone or the um, what I prefer, prefer, prefer to call it is the service network. So um, to review here we we have to have a router so we're going to use it to also do some basic packet filtering. Since we have a DMZ and a private network there's a, a really good argument here for a firewall and this would be the uh, the place most people would put it, I think. Sometimes you see drawings where the firewall is in front of the router, uh, between the router and the internet, and I don't agree with that. Um, I think you should put your router out front and let it do some of the um, basic packet filtering for you. So the firewall we have here has three interfaces. One's public, one hooks to our private network, and one to the service network. Now since we have three interfaces we can write rules concerning packets into and out of uh, any of the interfaces and actually all the interfaces. This gives us uh, more control over uh, our filtering. Slightly more complicated um, network diagram here and I've mentioned I've kind of uh, um, alluded to some of the issues here. We still have our packet filtering router, we still have the internet, uh, still have our firewall with three interfaces. Out here in our service network we have our two DNS servers uh, and these are for our internet domain. And I can't remember if I mentioned the fact that if you register a an internet domain, you have to give the registrar the IP address of two DNS servers that are authoritative for the domain that you're registering. You have to do this. So here's our two DNS servers for our internet domain. And the only thing these, these uh, DNS servers are going to, uh, these will answer, let's call this external. External DNS uh, answers queries for um, again, I'm having trouble with my my new tablet. Let me fix that. It seems like whenever you get near the edges. tablet it doesn't work as well answers queries so I'll try to concentrate here uh, for for the web email FTP um, the point is your external DNS servers only uh, are only there and only have records to support queries for um, your email servers, your web servers, your FTP servers if you're using any, um, etc. They're truly just public. Now, um, since I refer to this as a Microsoft network, internally 
we're going to have um, an Active Directory domain and we're, we're going to need at least two domain controllers and if you were using Active Directory integrated DNS uh, DNS will be running on our domain controller. So this DNS uh, is here to support Active Directory and it also handles um, internal queries for external resources. So this is uh, what we refer to as split DNS. And if you're sitting there wondering why are we talking about this and while we're talking about firewalls, this is more of a security issue. So this is a security class. Um, the the DNS your DNS servers are probably the highest value target um, in your organization, um, with the possible exception if you've got a database server sitting there with a hundred thousand. Um, um, credit card numbers and personal information to go with the credit card numbers that's a pretty high value target too but um, most people will tell you that you have to pay, pay particular attention to your DNS servers uh, if somebody compromises those they can change the records inside they can reroute the queries they can do a lot of damage um, so this particular setup here Yes, we have uh, four machines running DNS, minimum of four, um, and that's a lot of computers. But on the other hand, from a security standpoint, we've split our DNS. Uh, the one that uh, the our the DNS that supports Active Directory is totally separate from uh, the external um, DNS servers, and uh, the the idea here is, uh, again, you want to protect your internal resources, and for as far as the external DNS servers, you've got to have them out there. Now, these are the ones you want to monitor carefully, make sure that you're patched um, religiously. So, you're going to try to uh, minimize your exposure while doing the things that you have to do. Um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. There's a couple of other little wrinkles here that uh, we haven't talked about before. Uh, Syslog server. Uh, Syslog is, is uh, started out life as a Unix uh, type service. And I'm trying to think. It's uh, port 514. I'm just trying to remember whether it usually is um, runs over TCP or it's UDP. Okay, well we can look that up. Um, what a syslog server does, um, and it's, there's a reason it's a good idea to have a central um, syslog server. It uh, is uh, allows you to consolidate all your logs in one place, and it makes it easier to. Um, look at uh, um, if you have some sort of issue it's easier to correlate the logs because they're all in one place from a uh, from a security standpoint well from the firewall we're going to set up uh, logging on our router and we're going to have to open up a hole to the syslog server and again logging on the firewall and uh, put it over here on the syslog server too so those are things we're going to have to uh, uh, make sure we have rules for so let's see we've talked about 
the service network, we've talked about the internal network. In this case, I've uh, introduced this whole concept of split DNS, where you have external DNS to just simply handle uh, external issues. And then you have uh, internal DNS servers to handle the internal needs of your network. And uh, I've talked about syslog briefly. Now, um, we're going to come back and we're going to look at uh, um, some of these networks in more detail after we've done some uh, firewall configuration. So this is the same um, drawing that I had previously. And the reason I put it in twice, I wanted to kind of introduce you to um, some of the concepts. For example, if someone sends some mail, it's going to go through the router, and we're going to have to open up a hole in our um, firewall here for email. Now let's look at uh, briefly what that's going to look like. For email, from any IP, any TCP port, let me write this down and I'll explain it to you. To um, IP of our email server port, that's a T, TCP 25. So I wrote this out in English. Uh, you'll have to change the the syntax of this for the particular firewall that you're uh, going to be configuring. But let's look at this. The way email works, um, an email server, when in, uh, when when mail is getting moved from from uh, server to server, uh, there's going to be um, it's going to go over port 25. But the initiating connection, this is the from part. This is the source. We don't know what IP number the sending mail server is using. And since uh, the source port uh, is typically a, um, a higher numbered port uh, chosen at random, we don't know uh, what the source TCP port is. We do know the IP number of our email server and we know that the traffic is going to the destination, this is the des destination side. The destination is going to be TCP port 25. This is the port of the simple mail transfer protocol. So that would be uh, an example of, of um, a rule for email. And we could write a similar one for um, the web server or our external DNS servers. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, let's assume here that we want to write a rule to access our database server from our service network. Let's see what it would look like. So the source side is going to be from the IP of our web server uh, again any TCP port could be used to uh, as the source port to 
address uh, to IP of our DB server uh, TCP port uh, this is going to depend on which uh, database software you're using Just trying to think uh, Microsoft SQL Server for example is I want to say TCP for 1433 and 1434 but we'll have to look that up uh, let's put a big asterisk here that should have been a D uh, what I'm going to write here is this uh, what goes here depends on which database server we're using did it again just wipe that depends on database uh, software being used I'll erase that Right there. So my point here is, in some cases, when we're writing rules, we know very little about the the source. For the example of email, it could be any uh, IP number or and uh, any TCP port number. And in other cases, we know a lot about where, or in this case, we know. Uh, but we just still know everything. We know a lot about um, the connection from the web server on our uh, service network. And this was the rule we were writing. The second rule here. Um, so in some cases we know quite a bit about the initiating connection. In some cases we know very, very little. Um, but both of these are examples of rules that will uh, open up a hole in our firewall and allow traffic from one uh, one uh, interface to another. And of course, um, there are some other things we want to talk, think about here. Um, you know, the big thing is where in the order of things do you put these rules? Uh, if you know, for example, that you've been getting a lot of spam from a, from a particular um, a mail server at a particular IP address, you could write a rule to block that IP address, but you'd want to put it before this rule. Otherwise, this rule is going to be triggered first, and you're still going to get your spam. So rule order is important. We'll talk more about that later. So <clears throat> on this diagram... I give you an example of a, of a couple of rules, firewall rules, just written out in English. Now you have to translate this this into the syntax uh, of your particular firewall. And the firewall we're going to play with, um, you actually have a web-based management interface, and that's getting being that's increasingly common. So. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll write your rules out in something like what I've done here, and then you'll uh, go into the management interface and do some click, click, clicking, and um, enter your rules into your firewall. And then, of course, you want to test them. And um, I've been thinking about some ways to uh, uh, to test our rules. So we'll we'll get uh, we'll get to that. I hope. So I'm thinking that's all I need to uh, really talk about in this particular um, video.